So shall we begin? Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Jane Austen and Company. My name is Anne Fertig, and I'm a doctoral candidate in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as the co-director of Jane Austen and Company. Jane Austen and Company is a free public humanities series hosted by the Jane Austen Summer Program. Our first series, which took place at Durham Public Library in the 2019 to 2020 season, focused on historical female writers writing at the same time as Jane Austen. Our new series, which will take place online throughout 2020, is called Staying Home with Jane Austen, examining the domestic arts and social relationships found in Jane Austen. Tonight, we welcome our first speaker in the Staying Home with Jane Austen series, Tonight, Casey Highsmith will present Eating with Jane Austen. Can you say something, Casey? Hi, I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> you should all know that the videos and recipes you see here tonight were developed by Casey, especially for tonight's program, and we're so excited to have her. So uh, Dr. Inger Brody is going to introduce Casey for us. Hi, everyone. I think I know a lot of you. Um, my name is Inga Brody. I, I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill um, and co-founder and director of the Jane Austen Summer Program. Um, I want to second Anne's uh, remarks about this is so exciting to have our inaugural event of this new series um, and that, that Anne and I are co-hosting. Um, Casey, we're so delighted to have uh, Casey here today. She's originally from Texas um, and has a BA in Honors in French from University of Texas at Austin. Um, for those of you who are a little familiar with Jane Austen, you might know Janine Barkas, a good friend of mine, um, and she was uh, the Honors Thesis Director for um, Casey's work, I think, on food in Austin, right? Mm -hmm. um, she went on from there to do many things. Um, that's part of what makes her such an exciting speaker is that she's not only an academic but she's also a professional um, pr um, in so many different other ways which I'll explain. So she went on to get a master's in gastronomy from Boston University but she also spent a lot of time being a food writer and a food photographer um, and she worked for companies as diverse as King Arthur Flower and Oreo um, and for the, the Boston Globe um, working on, as I said, food writing and food photography, but also recipe testing and research, um, looking at things like urban farm to table, sustainability, and transnational food waste. Um, she has, um, in addition to these lots of national and international publications, um, she's also done a lot on media. She won an award for best student writing a few years ago from the Association of Food Journalists. Um, and I think she's nearly done with her PhD, um, which is on historical food waste um, and their relation to our modern consumption patterns and attitudes towards food, gender, society, media, et cetera. Um, so she will be able to talk to us both about the historical um, context of Austin and she also knows Austin's novels. So she'll be able to talk about uh, food in Austin as well. And I just want to jump in there. If any of you are interested, she has a fabulous Instagram with some of the most beautiful food photography you'll ever see. And you can find that under her name, Casey Highsmith. So definitely check it out after the program tonight. And about tonight's structure, we're going to um, have about a 30 minute or so presentation from Casey. And then we'll break for some questions um, and it will give you instructions on how to do that in just a minute. Um, then we will uh, see one or perhaps two of the exciting uh, recipe videos that Casey made for us for this evening. And um, we'll have then some more leisurely time for Q&A after that. So great. Now I'm going to introduce Emily Spera. Can you say hi, Emily? Hi, everyone. She's helping us uh, moderating tonight's program. She'll be the one moderating the chat and she'll be the one helping out with the Q&A. She is also a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill interested in the gender politics of 19th century British women. 
those of you joining us from the Jane Austen Summer Program probably recognize her as our beloved registrar of many years. And she's also our research assistant for Jane Austen and Company this summer. So Emily is now going to explain the question and answer process for tonight. Hi everyone. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled to have such a big number of you here. So many of you have probably been on a Zoom call before and tonight what we're doing is a Zoom webinar. This means that your cameras and microphones are automatically shut off and they will not be on at any point. This is just to allow us to kind of keep things under control a little bit because there are over a hundred of us here, it would be a lot if I had to go through and make sure that everyone's individual microphone was off. So instead, for you to participate, I would like you to use the Q&A box, which should be at the bottom of your screen. So you can use that box to send questions to all of the panelists, and I will be the one who keeps an eye on it and passes those questions on to Casey and to Anne and to Inger when the time is appropriate. I see that many of you know how to use the Zoom chat already, which is great. So, you know, we decided that we wanted everything in the Q&A box, but if you can't figure that out, go ahead and use the chat instead. I will be keeping my eye on both of them and we are so happy to have you here and we can't wait to see what questions you come up with for Casey. Thank you. I had one more thing to say is also that um, Casey was scheduled to be a part of our Jane Austen summer program this year um, and she was going to uh, develop some recipes to use for our Lovenses. Um, but I'm also happy to announce that she is going to be able to attend next year. Um, so just wanted to add that. Great. Well, after the uh, program tonight, uh, please stick around for more information about the Jane Austen Summer Program, which, um, as you know now, Casey will be attending. And um, for more about our online programming coming up this summer, please do note that tonight's program is being recorded. We will notify all of you once that recording is available online through our Facebook page. And uh, without further ado, Casey, would you like to take it away? Sure, yeah. So we're going to do a few little technical switches here. Make sure I'm pressing the right buttons. All right. Can I get one of our organizers to let me know that things are looking okay. Looks good. You may want to go full screen. Yeah. There we go. Is that still looking good? Uh-oh. I can't hear y'all. Is everything okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for that very flattering introduction. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, and um, especially talking about my first academic love, which was Jane Austen. And as Inger said, I have since kind of broadened my research and I look more um, at how women, generally speaking, um, in a couple different areas, specifically here in the United States, um, use food as a means of resistance. So I don't often get to talk about Jane Austen in my work, um, which for me is a huge bummer. Um, so I'm very excited to talk about her now. Um, but I wanted to kind of give y'all a little insight to where I'm coming from as a food studies scholar, um, which kind of includes a bunch of different methodologies and viewpoints. So food studies is a field um, and it's an academic discipline that studies the relationships between food and the human experience. And if I were in a class right now or in the library setting, I would want y'all to tell me what y'all thought the human experience entails. And the great thing about it is there's no wrong answer. Um, we all have to eat. Um, we all have recipes in our families, cookbooks or something like that. Um, food is a ubiquitous human experience and so we can all come to it with, with something um, which helps in unpacking some of the bigger issues when we use food as a lens for talking about culture. So in my world of food studies, we use food and that means all kinds of food, cooking, uh, making food, whatever it may be, um, to help us better understand things like class and race and gender, nationality and um, ethnicity, socioeconomic status and those changes over time, um, as well as geography and movement, um, globalization, as well as things like capitalism and economics. And kind of the list goes on and on and on. Again, there's no wrong answer. Food studies kind of covers it all. Um, so at our conferences, there's everyone does something different, which is really fun. 
Um, I'm usually the only Jane Austen person though, which is, which is also fun. So I wanted to give you this background before we jumped into Jane Austen to help you understand kind of where I'm coming from. Um, because I frequently have people say, oh, Jane Austen didn't have much food, or um, I didn't realize, you know, there was so much food in her world or in her books. Um, or my favorite phrase is usually, I didn't know food could be so complex. Um, and I like to, to share all of this with them. Um, so before we get started, um, I want to talk about how food helps us better understand Jane Austen's world, both her actual world, her lived experience, as well as her novels, which we know um, are just full of real life facts um, from her own world and the things that she observed. So food in her, in her world helps us better understand her characters and the relationships and the relationships she might have had to the real life people who inspired her characters. Um, occupations, whether they're farmers or gentlemen farmers. So think Robert Martin from Emma and Mr. Knightley from Emma. They, you know, have very different occupations to do with food um, and their status and class could not be more different. Um, land ownership, colonization, which is a huge, huge kind of foundation to Jane Austen's world at this point, um, as well as the food of that world. But it also helps us under thing, understand things like seasons. Um, we have to remember that seasonality is still a very big part of this world, while also not forgetting that globalization was still very much happening. You know, they had things that we often get surprised that they had, like citrus fruits and pineapples in Jane Austen's world, despite the fact that they did not grow there. Um, we also can learn things about class status, of course, um, and then Austen's own financial fluctuations and the changing status she had to deal with throughout her life. All of that from food, which is pretty cool. So for those of you who maybe just need a little refresher about Jane Austen's connections with food, I pulled some of the highlights out, I think. So I think it's important to remember that Jane Austen grew up on a farm. Um, her family managed a 200 acre farm next to their little home farm, which was about three acres next to their, um, next to the rectory. Um, her dad would have um, rented this farm and then rented it out to other people to help him farm. So they got a lot of their foodstuffs from there. They were, however, fairly low income. So they ended up creating a lot of DIY foodstuffs. Um, they also lived out in the countryside. So they wouldn't have had access to the same kind of stores that you would have seen in the urban areas. They lived in Hampshire County um, at least early on in life, um, which is in the southeast area of, of England. And if you've ever been, it literally looks like every Jane Austen film you've ever seen. Um, some of them are filmed there, obviously. Um, but it's a huge ag community. Um, the rolling landscapes, it's very picturesque. Um, it grows all sorts of things. Um, so they were in a great position to be farmers. Um, in one of her letters, very early on in life, she wrote that she carried about the keys of the wine and closet, which meant that she was in charge of the food in her house, not necessarily prepping it, but she was the woman um, tasked with, which it was almost always a woman, tasked with um, keeping an inventory, ordering more food, uh, making sure, you know, people weren't snacking at all hours, um, literally holding the keys. Um, so that was an important part of her household duties. Um, and lastly, I think it's really important, and this kind of goes with any woman of this time, Jane Austen, given her status um, as kind of a lower status um, person in the landed gentry, um, and as a woman, would have inherited taught and embodied food knowledge from her parents and other relatives, just by living on a farm, working in a kitchen of a household that, you know, maybe had a cook, but still needed people to participate in the preparation or the gathering of food. Um, and embodied just means um, you learn it like at the apron strings. Does that phrase kind of make sense for most, I think? Um, uh, it, it means like you weren't sitting here watching a PowerPoint, you were living it and learning it at the same time. So most of us get a lot of our food knowledge from embodied experience, watching our parents, our grandparents, etc. All right. So in order to think about food in Jane Austen, because there's so much, my undergraduate thesis, I don't know if uh, Dr. Barkas is on this call right now, but she would probably laugh. It was an exorbitantly long thesis because I wanted to include all of the foods um, that I could find um, and silly little undergraduate me should have known better. So there's so much to talk about, but I wanted to break it down into what I thought were kind of manageable parts. Um, 
for understanding food more broadly. So we're going to talk about growing food in Jane Austen's time, buying food in Jane Austen's time, and making food, and all of the kind of complexities that those entail. So growing food in Jane Austen's time. Um, this was the middle of the British agricultural Revo revolution, so a huge time. This same revolution was happening here in the States around the same time, the, colon the colonies actually, not the States so much yet, um, right there on the cusp. Remember, late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, this was a time when King George farm was known as Farmer George. He fancied himself as um, as a farmer, he liked the nickname Farmer George, and he had a model farm next to one of his um, houses, his, his palaces, and um, wanted to make agriculture very fashionable. Um, and so you find this um, uprising of gentlemen farmers. So think about all the farmers in Jane Austen's works. Um, I think, again, Mr. Knightley is a perfect example of this, um, and probably a good example of how to be a good gentleman farmer from what we know of Mr. Knightley. He was a good person and treated his tenants really well. But that's, that's exactly what a gentleman farmer is. He has tenants and he makes his wealth off the land. Um, to be a gentleman farmer, it, um, you wanted to do that because it emulated the monarchy. Remember, the landed gentry were not nobility. They were the, a little bit lower than that. And so they wanted to be like the monarchy and the arist um, aristocracy right above them. Um, but being a gentleman farmer also served as an opportunity to demonstrate one's wealth and assets your land, even if you didn't necessarily actually farm. Um, so um, while agriculture during this era is marked almost entirely by the product of enslaved people's labor, remember we were talking about colonization, and this was the heyday of the transatlantic trade, which included agricultural goods produced by enslaved people as well as the trade of the people themselves. This was also the era of significant agricultural revolution, which included new agricultural methods such as crop rotation, enclosures, um, the removal, um, um, various agricultural tariffs, um, and then lots of infrastructure such as um, better farm to market roads. Just roads made it easier to be better at agriculture. Canals and improved drainage and irrigation. And most interestingly, um, agricultural publications and literature, which King George very much had a part in. He wanted to make sure all of his wealthy landed gentry had some, something to socialize about. So lots of agricultural societies started and universities started wanting to do more with husbandry and agriculture. So you could go to a school and get a degree in how to be a farmer, which is really just how to manage poorer farmers to work your land. So there's a lot tied up in that. And I wanted to pause real quick also about enclosures. Um, sorry, my phone is buzzing. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't one of y'all. Um, enclosures. So this picture behind you, I think y'all can all see. Um, you see the little tree lines. Very picturesque, looks like you know your typical what you would imagine of the English countryside. So this was created. Um, trees don't grow that way, obviously. <laughs> Um, this at one at one time before uh, before King George and before gentleman farming became kind of the the ideal um, farmland was more of a common area. You had a common field where you would graze your cows. You had a common area where you might plant fruit trees, and there was an understanding that other people might be able to come help you with it and then get some for their own. Um, there was a, a little bit more sense of community. Part of the landed gentry's um, exchange was getting land given to them by the monarchy, and they then enclosed that land. So there were various enclosure acts passed through um, the parliament to create what you see before you, effectively, what we know as the typical Jane Austen landscape. All right, so Austen's own family farm serves as a good example of what, me what might be grown on a smaller Regency era farm. Um, she talks about sheep, uh, growing sheep or raising sheep for mutton. Her dad's mutton was evidently um, a big deal. So he took part in the in the food process. She talks about chickens for meat and eggs, um, as well as turnips, specifically turnips. So that must have been a significant crop, as well as lots of grains and cereals. So they were able to glean a lot from their own land. Uh, so yeah. So next I want to talk about buying food in Jane Austen's time. So we often romanticize Jane Austen and many other period histories with this notion um, that everything was made um, at home in a quaint little kitchen 
When in reality, food shops, including groceries, bakeries, sweet shops, breweries, butchers, have existed for centuries because turning raw agricultural product into an edible product was an incredibly hard, arduous, and time-consuming job. I mean, it still is, right? Um, convenience is what we pay for, so they still paid for convenience then. In addition to time and skills, uh, food production required space. Uh, people who lived in the cities would often have um, would often have less less space. Obviously, anyone who's been to England or Europe knows how small some of those um, older houses can be, especially you know the kitchen area. Um, so dealing with less space for food storage and less space space for food production. Um, people would have relied to some degree on various shops and other skilled workers to provide their daily food. Common purchased foods during this time included things like bread, like we talked about, uh, beer and wine, sweets like bath buns, which is that little picture up in the top um, corner. And that's a modern picture, obviously, of Sally Lund's bath buns in Bath, um, which Jane talks about when she lived in Bath. Um, imported goods uh, like tea and coffee and sugar. Those are kind of obvious ones that you'd have to purchase but also things like dairy, you have the dairy made there, as well as meat and fish, and importantly, some non-local fruits such as citrus and any kind of hothouse variety that wouldn't necessarily grow in normal English countryside conditions. In a letter to her sister, Austin talks about the price um, when she was visiting town, about the, the price of plums and apricots, almonds and raisins and tamarinds at the grocery. Um, so she had access to all these kinds of foods, which is what I think we really kind of romanticize, like I was saying. Um, we think that they only had certain foods, when in reality they had quite a bit. Um, it just might have been at the store. Um, so one of the things that I think we can really glean from the purchase of foods is that poor or rich people still had to buy food from shops, farmers, middlemen. Um, these middlemen were sometimes known as costermongers. Um, and they were the ones who might bring things out into the countryside. Um, we also know that purchased food was not created equal. Quality varied wildly. Um, and I think really good examples of this are, um, on the high end, we have Mr. Darcy's Hot House Produce. Um, in Pride and Prejudice, if you remember, Elizabeth is visiting uh, Pemberley, and she's talking with Georgiana, and there's this beautiful pyramid of grapes, nectarines, and peaches that kind of just draws Elizabeth's attention. And it's a very strange kind of aside in this beautiful description of the house and Georgiana and Elizabeth slowly realizing that she might be in love with Mr. Darcy. Um, this aside about peaches and grapes and nectarines, but it's hugely demonstrative of the absolute ridiculous wealth of Pemberley and Mr. Darcy, because those would have had to have been grown in a hot house, which he would have either purchased the construction of on his land or more likely had brought up into, um, you know, with other foodstuffs. And those would have been very expensive. And this can be juxtaposed in her books also with um, Fanny Price's family in Mansfield Park. Remember when Fanny Price is forced to return to Portsmouth, um, kind of as a punishment, and there's a long passage describing kind of the filth that her family lives in. Remember, she idolizes them and tries to think fondly of them all the time, but when she's back in that space in her old home, it's very quickly realized upon her that it's not good. Um, and one of the things that Austin fixates on in this long list of descriptions is the family's milk bucket um, was a mixture of moats floating in thin blue. And there's two reasons why blue uh, milk would have been blue then. One was when you have raw milk, because it wouldn't have been homogenized at this point, you have cream on top, and then a slowly, slowly delineating quality of milk towards the bottom of the barrel. The bottom, the most bottom of the barrel would have obviously been less quality, um, and over time, it, um, when it sours, this, this, the milk that's not homogenized, it turns blue, it has a blue sheen to it. So it's indicating that this milk was old and very low quality. The other more concerning probable um, situation was that it was adulterated. Um, milk was often um, made, uh, extended, um, dairies extended their milk surplus or um, availability with various chemicals and things like that. So this thin blue could also be referring to kind of an oily sheen on top of the milk, um, indicating that it's you know, not only low quality, but it also could have some questionable substances in there. So I think it's hugely important to remember that purchasing food was still very much a reality for Jane Austen and her characters and all of these little things that go into it.
So making food in Jane Austen's time, um, they obviously made a bunch of different foods. The quotes I picked for you here, I really enjoy um, because they're all from Jane Austen's letters over different times. They're all to her sister and they all talk about making alcohol. Um, we know from her letters, Jane Austen was a huge fan of homemade booze. And um, these three are really fun. Um, and even when she went away, she um, always would write back like the last quote says, I long to know something of the mead, dear Cassandra. Please let me know how it's going. Um, she was obsessed with making her own orange wine, mead, spruce beer. Um, she made various kinds of plum wines. And she was not alone. This was a normal thing for many women to be taking part of. Um, but it's a really helpful kind of remembering of, a, you know, this kind of quaint person that we think of when we think of Jane Austen. So in between growing and actually harvesting your own food, and buying it from the shop, there were plenty of people who would have produced food in their homes, um, regardless of urban or rural location, and regardless of wealth for the most part. Um, even the wealthy made their own foods, it just kind of took on a different meaning. Um, and I do wanna pause here and remind us too that predominantly the people making food were women. Um, the people in charge of the domestic every day were women. Yes, there were men in the kitchens. There were boys in the kitchens as assistants. Any chefs of the time, which there were many, especially in France, would have been men. Um, so there is a very clear gender divide here. Just, just to, it's helpful to remember. So um, items that would have been made, everyday items that would have been made in the home included things like certain breads or bake, base, basic biscuits or breakfast breads, um, as well as more specialty items that marked significant occasions like a birthday or a season, like when you preserve summer fruits for jams or jellies or making homemade spruce beer, as uh, Austin has done here, excuse me, and as Mr. Knightley does in, in Emma, um, which in all reality, he probably had a, a servant do it, a woman most likely, um, and then gets the credit for it. Um, but who knows, Mr. Knightley was a good guy. Um, there's also plenty of instances of homemade foods, including things like tea mixtures, cordials, broths, herbal mixtures, as well as these kinds of alcohols listed here that were used as common medicine. So another reason for them to be made in the home and very bespoke and specific to the person, uh, to the family that they're being served to or the actual person who's sick. So what they make is very important, but what I think is, is almost a little bit more important is who is making it. So we know Austin made food. And I think this next clip that I want to show y'all is really helpful. So this clip is from the 2005 Pride and Prejudice for those who have um, and haven't seen it. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, it's not in the books. I just want to clarify. Um, and this is kind of a contentious scene, I think, for some folks. But I really think that the, uh, the choices made in the scene really kind of get at the heart of what um, food and making food means to this kind of precarious family, the landed gentry of the Bennett family, who are technically gentility, but very low income still because of their five daughters, what all of that means. So we're gonna watch this super quick clip. What a superbly featured room and what excellent boiled potatoes many years since I've had such an exemplary vegetable. To which of my fair cousins should I compliment the excellence of the cooking? Um, so I, I love that scene. Um, and I couldn't find a longer clip, but the rest of the clip has Mrs. Bennett, if you remember it, in a tizzy. Um, and she very quietly is, tells Mr. Collins, um, you know, Longbourn is perfectly able to keep a cook, um, indicating that, of course, her daughters didn't cook this. Um, even though they might have, um, or participated in something. Um, so it's this huge kind of complex negotiation of complementing the food, um, complementing the work that went into it, but that balance of whether or not you acknowledge this family who's supposed to be um, of a slightly upper class, um, whether or not that family took part in the production of the food in the kitchen, especially the women. Um, so there's lots of kind of complexities that we can glean um, that I think that the movies kind of pick up on a little bit of that sometimes more than the books do. They kind of take it and run with it. So one of the ways that we know how people were cooking, what they were making, is through historical cookbooks. And this is an area that I really focus on 
um, in my teaching and as well in my, um, my current dissertation work. Um, because there's just a wealth of historical cookbooks out there. And what's really cool is at the end of this, I've provided a couple of links to archives that y'all can go look at some of these historical cookbooks. You can look at the actual um, visuals like you see here on the screen or HTML kind of text downloads. And you can have a gander at all these different versions. There's also some really cool reproductions of them all over um, the web, uh, especially at like museum stores. So if you're looking for um, an actual hard copy, they're pretty easy to find. This one um, is The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy by Hannah Glass. So um, it's important to remember that literacy and access to books was a privilege during Austin's time. Clearly, Austin was very well educated, especially for a woman, and it's likely she had access to many of the public cook uh, popular cookbooks of the time. But knowing what we know about literacy rates and book access in Great Britain during her time, it's also likely that these cookbooks were written for the wealthier classes or as aspirational books for the lower classes who hope to emulate those above them. Um, so this historical context is hugely important when reading historical cookbooks and thinking about how people actually ate. So whenever we think about any cookbook, um, but especially during a historical period of intense financial and social and educational difference like Jane Austen experienced in her own life, um, we should remember that published cookbooks were performative, they were prescriptive, they told you how to cook, how to set up your table, um, and aspirational. And so this is not to belittle the women who wrote these amazing texts. Um, as you see here, Hannah Glass and Martha Bradley and Mary Cole, um, they were all hugely important women. Um, but it's a reminder that they weren't speaking for all the women in Great Britain. Um, knowing all of these details about common cookbooks and food literature of the era, um, it's important to turn to additional women's literature, such as journals, diaries and, di and daily household ledgers, where they kind of like took notes about like what to order, your grocery lists, your, your old, old timey grocery lists, um, that provided additional insight to how women's domestic duties actually played out um, and what people actually ate day to day and how they ate it and, you know, how they laid it on their table. Um, and this is why Jane Austen's letters are so important, as well as the food related writings of her friend Martha Lloyd whose original, original recipes fill many of the Austin-related cookbooks that you'll see out and about. This is kind of one of the, the oldest ones. Um, and this, is, this has got Martha Lloyd's original recipes as well as kind of parsed versions of them. Um, it's hugely important to rely on these texts alongside Austin's books um, to, to fully understand what food meant in that time. Another really important book, which um, I read as an undergraduate from the original, um, the original manuscript, and it has since become published, which is very exciting. Um, so I have my like painstakingly taken notes um, from uh, when I was there researching. Um, it's, it's in England, it's in the, in the old, um, the Chawton House Library, which is dedicated to women's um, literature. Um, it's the Knight Family Cookbook, which was compiled by Thomas Knight, and it was passed down to Edwin Austin Knight, which was Jane Austen's brother, who was adopted by the Knight family. Um, and so it's a really important cookbook. You can find this one online too. Um, and it has recipes that we feel almost certain Jane would have been involved with, um, made, a, made use of, and potentially added to. So that's a really exciting kind of feature. So um, I wanted to end, <clears throat> excuse me, our conversation today with a little bit of discussion about the rituals of tea. So if we associate anything with Jane Austen, it's tea, right? We have Jane Austen themed teas. Um, all these Jane Austen events always have a tea. Um, and they're all accurate. They, the British had a lot of tea then. Um, but that's kind of like the thing we associate, right? This image here from the latest Emma movie just screams Jane Austen, obviously. And they're, and they're holding tea. And they have beautiful tea things in the background. Um, but of all the foodstuffs in Austen's book, tea I find most helpful in kind of parsing out all of these complex issues about race and gender and class because it's a it's a foodstuff that really kind of encompassed all of that um, it speaks so much to british um, globalization and british colonization um, and then within within the country itself it speaks to a lot of the class divide who was drinking tea um, and how so i wanted to give you all a little bit of rundown of what tea would have looked like then <clears throat> Excuse me. So tea greetings were a huge marker of class. 
So um, it's important to separate the beverage tea, which is kind of what you see here, from the ritual of drinking tea and all of that entailed, which we'll go over in just a second. So tea importation rose from about 40,000 pounds in 1699 to an annual average of 240,000 pounds in 1708. So that's a very short time span, right? Um, tea quickly proved popular enough to replace ale as the national drink of England. And because it was a hot item, you had to boil it to make it, to make it work, right? Um, it became a safe drink. Um, it replaced ale for, for children who were drinking watered down ale because that was a safer drink than plain water. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but thanks to many methods of adulteration, which we know there wasn't a whole lot of oversight of that at all during this time, um, and not also a lack of, there was a lack of quality control, all classes could soon afford some kind of tea. Um, it just kind of, it was very different. So that's why it's a huge help in kind of understanding what, what's going on in these books and in Jane Austen's world. So about 1750, by about then, tea was ubiquitous for everyone in England. And um, so Jane Austen was born in 1775. So a full, you know, 25 years later, it was normal. So what you see here in your, um, in your picture is um, the actual tea plant. And so all tea comes from the same tea plant, Camellia sinicensis. Um, green tea, black tea, all of it's the same. If you have something like chamomile tea, um, the tea moniker is kind of just a nicety. Um, there's no actual tea in it most of the time. It's just referring to how it's prepared. So chamomile tea is literally just chamomile flowers. But real tea comes from this plant. Um, and no matter where it's grown, it's all the same plant. And all of these little words on the side you'll see um, refer to the different leaves of the branch and the quality of those leaves and how they roll when they're roasted or picked. Um, and so if you've ever ordered tea at a restaurant that doesn't um, traffic in really good tea, so it's not a cafe, it's not a tea shop, you're brought out a pot of hot water and maybe like a little bitty box that has tea that you can, tea bags you can flip through. And if you have a black tea bag, um, you usually have some kind of letters on it like OP, FOP, and that refers to orange pico or flowery orange pico, which is talking about the different parts of the tea leaf. So it's telling you what grade of tea it is. Whether or not it's true is a whole nother issue. <laughs> Um, so this next picture you see here in the middle is talking about how tea leaves were graded after they were picked and dried and roasted and whatever method made sense for green tea or black tea or whatever it may be. Um, so they had to sift the tea. There's a, I wish I had this for you, is a giant um, stack of plates, little, um, that had mesh at the bottom except for the very lowest one. And they'd put the tea leaves at the top and they'd shake and shake and shake and shake and shake. And whatever fell at different levels were the different um, designations you see in front of you. So whole leaves would be at the top, they'd be the highest ranking. Broken leaves would be at the next few levels. Fannings would be almost at the very bottom and dusts at the very, very, very lowest at the bottom bottom cup where it, where it gathered. And fannings and dusts were the lowest grade of tea. And they were also the easiest to adulterate, to add stuff to you, um, things like wood shavings, um, there were several other herbs that could be dried and look like tea and even smell like tea when they were being boiled, but they had maybe some far less savory consequences, um, gastrointestinally speaking. Um, so, so there were lots of different ways that tea purveyors could change the tea offerings that allowed lower classes to purchase and consume it, still getting you know the caffeine hit that they, that they quickly became accustomed to. Um, while still allowing the upper classes to have the fanciest tea. Another method that the tea might have come to English tables in was a tea brick. Um, and if we were in person, I could hand you my actual tea brick that I have. Um, it's really fun to see and it smells just delicious of tea. Um, there were a couple different ways bricks could be prepared. They could be, you know, the nicer quality of the broken leaf. Um, this is literally tea smushed together for long voyages and the stamps on top typically, I'm not sure what this stamp indicates, but they typically indicated the trading company. So like East India Trading Company, Dutch East India, um, and these could be shipped overseas. So when you hear about the Boston Tea Party, when they dumped all the tea into the Boston Harbor, it was most likely tea bricks that were dumped in. Um, my tea brick is actually from Boston, so um, it's a little, it, it talks about that history rather than this one. 
So um, all this is important to know, all these like nuances about actual tea are important to understand how tea ritual and tea etiquette worked. Um, so tea could be consumed throughout the day and it was frequently served to house guests if they visited during the non meal time. It was not the high tea that most of us associate with Austin. That ceremonial style of tea came around a few decades later in the Victorian era, which we often get um, those eras conflated. A lot of folks see Victorian and they assume Jane Austen, but they couldn't be really more different. Um, most commonly, tea was typically an after dinner event. Um, when she lived at Godmersham Park, Austin took tea after 6.30 p.m. That was what she told her sister. Um, and it was often accompanied by chocolates, uh, coffees, small sweets, cordials, and other light refreshments depending on what people had to eat before, what was planned for later, um, and then kind of the season, depending on, you know, if it, fruits were in season. Um, so most could afford some kind of tea. The quality varied, like we said. Um, nonetheless, tea was a way, um, the way tea was consumed varied from, varied from class to class. Sometimes it was a hurried cup in the morning for the working class to get that caffeine hit because they like I said, quickly grew accustomed to this larger kind of ordeal. Um, a formal invitation to tea always implied an after-dinner gathering with some sort of entertainment, whether it was games or music or conversation. Um, tea served as a ritual of communication. It was a way for you to glean information about new people in town, um, someone that you might not be on the best terms with, so you invite them to tea and kind of make amends and you, you learn all the gossip. Um, it was a way that you could theoretically meet with the opposite sex in kind of a safe kind of chaperoned space. Um, evenings that had tea often ended in informal dances. Um, and so when you see the movies or in the books, you see balls and things like that happening. And you often see tea rooms set aside um, during these public parties for people to, to take refreshments and also take part of this kind of ritual. Um, and this is where all of the ritual and etiquette that we know from tea today, all of this high tea, if you ever have tea at you know, a fancy hotel, all of that kind of comes from some of this. So some of the main tenets of tea etiquette, um, and what I think is the most important thing to take away from this is that these are just kind of general ones, is um, you had to use the best China service. There was a bunch of different ones. Right before um, Austin's time, Wedgwood China came about. Um, so Wedgwood China, if you ever think of kind of that blue and white China print, um, that's kind of classic Wedgwood. Um, and Austin did have Wedgwood, um, both at Steventon, which unfortunately was sold when her father died, and then she got another set when she moved to Chawton. Um, you had to use the highest quality tea leaves that you could afford. Um, which varied. And of course, there were different um, types. There were also flavorings. Um, and that was kind of bespoke to the person. You always included other refreshments because you never know if someone doesn't take tea um, or if they need something else <clears throat> to go with it. And the hostess typically serves and prepares each cup, asking guests how they prefer their tea, if they take sugar or milk, um, if they like it strong or weak, which depends on how and when you pour it. You pour a weak cup first and a strong cup last because all the tea leaves settle to the bottom of the pot. Um, so there are all these nuances in there for the hostess, for the guests, but also for behind the scenes who prepared the tea. So the lower classes would likely, if they were to have people over for tea, would have prepared it themselves, whereas the upper classes and the landed gentry would likely have a servant do the preparation behind in the kitchen and it would be brought out for the hostess to play a part. Um, and I liken that a lot to, um, since we're in the States, we'll create a metaphor, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to like slicing the Thanksgiving turkey. It's kind of a big show, you do a ceremonial kind of slice, and then it gets taken into the kitchen and chopped up and, and served. Um, so there was so much involved with tea etiquette. Um, but what I think is, is hugely important, <clears throat> again, is that all of these books about tea, all of these things we know about tea, um, again, come from some of these prescriptive bits of literature. They come from when Austin was trying to make a point. Um, they come from these cookbooks that were written by the wealthy for other people to aspire to. So we, we know how people wanted to drink tea, and we frequently know how they did based on journals and things like that. And what I think that leaves us is that there was a huge kind of range of how people consume tea, how people use tea as a ritual, um, and kind of navigated this this crazy world of food in, in, their, in their worlds or in their lives. Um, 
Yeah, and I think that tea metaphor kind of extends to all kinds of foods. So we can kind of take everything that we know from Jane Austen's books, and especially from the movies, obviously, with a grain of salt and do a little bit of research and learn so much more about what that food meant, um, why Austen maybe pointed out a specific adjective about a food, the blue milk, um, the pyramid of peaches, um, and then how people are drinking what seems just like plain tea. There's so much in those conversations. Um, so there's just a lot to unpack, which makes it really exciting. So I put together a few resources, which I think the coordinators will be able to share later um, of some Austin specific books that I've admired, um, some Great Britain specific stuff to get more specifics on that. Um, I didn't really touch on alcohol too much, but there's a lot of really cool information about alcohol. Um, and then those historical cookbook archives, um, which the links are there and both of those have public facing stuff so you can go see them. Um, and there's just some really great stuff out there for you to kind of dive into while you're stuck at home with Austin. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Casey. Yeah. Uh, we've had several interesting questions come in. Um, a couple of people, both Lisa and Julie, were interested in the difference between dinner and supper, what time they take place, and how they relate to the timing of tea. Yeah, so dinner was, I'm going to miss them up because in the South, where I grew up in Texas, we call, I even took my notes, um, we call supper something very different, right? And so I, I, try, I want to make sure I'm getting it, remembering it correctly and not confusing it with my own. So dinner was earlier and it was normally around 5 p.m., 5 to 6. And it, of course, varied for a bunch of different reasons, like we talked about, whether you worked full day, a full day, whether you were, um, you know, a landed gentry and you just kind of moseyed your way into dinner. Um, it was more formal, especially if there were guests. Um, and cookbooks of the era outline different kinds of placement for how to set up a table. They tell you exactly like who can be paired with who to walk into the dining room, um, like how, you know, which elbow goes on elbow, um, how to arrange courses on the table. There's some beautiful, in these cookbooks that I linked y'all to, there's some beautiful plates in the back of the cookbooks that show like summer party menu and it gives you all the different plates like you're looking on top of a table. Um, so yeah, dinner was very formal. Um, supper would have been a later meal. Um, supper would have been a lot less informal. Um, and it usually would have been after an event. So say you had guests and they stayed for games. Supper would have been something you kind of took afterwards, sometimes with tea. Supper and tea could have gone together or they could have been kind of its own thing. Um, supper was also something you might have seen, um, excuse me, at a ball, because balls went into the night. And so they would have offered refreshments. You could sup at the ball. Um, and they would have been light refreshments, not only because they were late into the evening, but also because you might still be partaking in activities like dancing. And these um, items might include something like soup, like negu. I don't, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's, um, it's a French style soup that's made with calves foot jelly and dairy. It, it sounds very unappetizing, but evidently it was part of a light supper. Um, as well as fortified drinks, such as wine with like spices or wine with spirits. So like wine fortified with brandy. So you drink like a small glass of it. So yeah, I think that got to the question. We've, we've uh, never, we've thought about offering Negu at our, at our small suppers oh, at no. our halls, but uh, never quite had the courage. I, I don't have the courage. To <laughs> um, I'll be fine if I ever, never have it. Susan Allen Ford asks, um, if, do you have any sense of how expensive cookbooks were or how likely people like the Austins were to own one or more? Or was it more likely that they'd merely have receipt books compiled by members of the family? So both. I think it would have been, um, cookbooks would have been a status just as they are today. Um, you know, cookbooks are still very expensive. Um, and I think they would have, I, I am, unfortunately can't like name an actual price we could certainly like get at what they would have cost. We could have, we could do some calculations, um, but I think it's safe to assume that they would have been expensive, but they would have also been something you could have passed down. Um, so they would have become part of this knowledge that was passed down from generation to generation, specifically with women, um, especially when like a daughter got married and was about to run her own household. So it would have been one of those initial first time purchases, kind of like the joy of cooking is here in the United States or, um, Julia Child's Art of French Cooking set that is kind of costly and always has been, even when she was first publishing it, um, because you bought it, you kept it, and you passed it on. So they would have been expensive. Um, and whether or not people had multiples, I, 
my guess is they would have likely had multiple cookbooks because so many were coming out at this time. Um, copyright of recipes still does not exist to this day, at least in the US, there's no copyright of recipes. And back then it was just an absolute wild, wild west of just reproduction after reproduction of very similar recipes without any kind of attribution. So my, my thinking is they would have had several, you know, their three favorites if they, if they were of the means to afford them, which Austin's family would have been. Um, and they were also very um, proud of their education and their literacy. So it was, you know, it was part, par for the core for that. Um, and then personal recipe books, um, definitely. Most women kept journals or letters and um, you know they might not have had a separate book, a full re um, receipt book like we see at the Knight Family Receipt Book, which is this great big thing in real life. It's just this giant tome. Um, they were really aspirational on how many recipes they were hoping to fill it with, I think. Um, but I, 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 we find more recipes in women's um, correspondence to each other. Um, and Austin asks in her letters multiple times, sorry, I'm gesturing to my stack of books. She asks in her letters multiple times um, of friends. Um, she, she'll write a lengthy letter and then like halfway through, she'll be like, I think it's appropriate now for me to ask you for that recipe, which is really the sole reason for this letter. Um, thank you and bye. And um, so we, we see a lot more of that in there. Um, which we, we, we are missing a lot of Austin's letters. Cassandra burned a lot of them after her death. So who knows how many more kind of, I, I don't think those are scandalous items. So if they were burned, it was by accident, I'm sure. But um, so yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of recipe kind of um, production happening within the family and then kind of in mass too. What about people who say couldn't afford these recipe books or who might not have had the same economic means as the Austin family? Mary wants to know, what would the poor subsist on in Austin's time? So the poor would have um, subsisted on some very basic foods that really didn't require a lot of kind of um, specificity. Um, so I think it's important to remember that baking Think about it in your own home kitchens, um, especially if you're someone who's who's not, you know, you're, cooking is not maybe necessarily your favorite thing or, um, or something you're really comfortable with. Um, you can probably cook a regular meal, you know, meat, vegetables, kind of um, based off of this knowledge you've picked up over your adult life and childhood. Um, but you might need to go pick up a book for baking because it's a little bit more of a science. There's some chemistry involved. So we kind of see that play out in, in all classes, um, but especially the lower classes. So you'd see um, quick breads made with kind of um, leaveners rather than something like a sourdough, or you'd see them purchasing these goods because they couldn't make them. Um, so you see kind of um, shortcuts kind of, but really they're just kind of educational shortcuts. They're, they're shortcuts to kind of get to um, the end result without having to have these cookbooks. Surely some folks had access to cookbooks, um, especially those who were serving others, the serving class serving these families had access to the cookbooks. Um, and many of them could read, at least read the numbers for the recipes. Um, and I think that's also one of the reasons that recipes were so short. It was just like to the point, this is all you need to know. Um, they weren't very um, wordy at all. If you go look at those historical cookbooks, you'll see. Um, so I think there was kind of, you know, some people did use these cookbooks regardless of their class, um, but it was because that's what their station called of them. Um, and as far as actual foods, um, another really important thing to remember during Jane Austen's time is that the Napoleonic Wars were happening right around this time. And um, for all intents and purposes, the continent was shut down. So, so Europe was shut down. And England quickly shifted in somewhat of a patriotic way, but also in like, we don't have access to our good French wines and these fancy French tarts that we brought in. Um, they quickly shifted to this very homey style of cooking, which didn't, again, require a whole lot of precision. They didn't require a lot of baking precision. Um, it was it was very um, touch and feel, like you, you, you based things by the touch of the oven, how hot it was rather than, um, you know, a specific kind of, mark there was no marks on the ovens then either but um yeah there was a lot more just like you had the knowledge within you from learning rather than having to refer to a book i think that answers. we've had several questions about specific foods um so um katarina for example asks if you've ever researched how produce differed from today so for example breeds of chicken apple varieties or is there a book you'd recommend on that subject 
Yes. Um, so the books I think I've listed would be would touch on all of those things. Um, and then while you're there, you so I love reading bibliographies because then you get to see all the really exciting primary resources. Some of these secondary resources heard. I'm sorry. I don't know if you can. My kids are at my door knocking. Um, uh, so you can. Um, the produce. So, so yeah, those books that I listed at the end of this slide um, or this, this presentation would be great resources for that. Um, and one of the ways that I think is really exciting to see changes is that back then they also wrote agriculture, especially right then when agriculture was, was exciting and fashionable. They wrote these lengthy, lengthy um, treatises on apples. There's one um, called Pomona, which is uh, Latin, I think, for apple, and it talks about all the different apple apple varieties in the world, um, and then all the ones that they were currently cultivating in England during the late 1600s, early 1700s. Um, and um, there's another one by the same guy on salads, which he spells with a T, which he's referring like salads, and he's referring to leafy greens. Um, so there was lots of propagation. There was lots of what we would call today genetically modified. Um, produce um, that we see. So we know that produce would have definitely, and animals, um, specifically thinking like of chickens, would have been smaller. Um, they would have been maybe less sweet. A lot of the vegetables we've um, cultivated, at least here in the United States um, and in England, have been cultivated to be sweeter. So our corn, our, um, our apples, um, any of the starchier kind of things, we've, we've made it so they have less bitter taste to them. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's some really exciting <clears throat> changes that are happening in produce that you're, you're living it right now. Um, and you are also able to live some of these older types of produce. If you go to some of your farmer's markets, they might have some of these heirloom varieties because they're becoming popular again um, to bring about these like older apples and these older, um, these older lettuces and greens and things like that. So um, yeah, some great resources out there. Maybe we should take one more question before we show a video. Okay. So what would they have known about nutrition back then? What were their, um, Kate wants to know, did, would they have much knowledge about nutrition or what ideas did they have about the health of their food? So just like today, <laughs> the, the thoughts on everything changed like decade to decade, right? Um, <clears throat> I think every decade of, of my life, they've gone back and forth on whether salt is good for you. Mm -hmm. um, so I can only imagine how much had changed over the time uh, between Austin's time and now. Um, around her time, they considered sugar to be good for you and good for your stomach, um, like good for settling a stomach. And so one of the recipes you'll see today is a cordial, which is mostly sugar, and um, it was meant to be sipped and it would settle your stomach. What actually settles your stomach is probably the vinegar that's in it, but the sugar was nice too. Um, so you see sugar in a lot of things, especially things for sick people. Um, most of these cookbooks will have sections at the back called, um, so I don't know if you can see my cat in the background. Everyone's joining the conversation today. Um, uh, the back of these cookbooks will have sections um, called um, recipes for the sick or recipes for invalids. And they'll have things like broth, tea, and things like that. But they'll also have lots of sugary, um, like you, you just pour sugar over grains and have them eat warm grains with sugar. So sugar was a big deal. Um, they didn't quite know too much about um, adulteration and germ theory at this point. So there was still a lot of concern there. Um, they knew enough not to drink water. Um, so, the, so the beer was a big deal. Um, but then when tea got brought in, you know, caffeine kind of replaced that. So um, nutrition kind of skewed more towards really concerning about alcohol because the effects of alcohol were the same then as they are now. Like alcohol is deleterious to your health um, and to the family structure and society. So most of their nutritional concerns were with how you, how food helped you operate in society. Um, and so alcohol became a big deal. There's a wonderful um, visual called Benjamin Rush's um, Moral Thermometer, and he's actually an American. Um, and, it, and it shows the different like deadliness of, of drinks and milks like down here at the bottom. It's not the lowest, but it's down here. <laughs> and then you have rum at the very top and then like pure grain alcohol up here. And it talks about all these things. So that was a bigger deal to them than, um, than other things. Vegetables is another thing that most people wonder, like did they, did they eat a lot of vegetables? Did they boil them to death? 
um, the way so many people associate British food today is associated with like boiled to death vegetables. Um, they did, they did boil to death vegetables, um, but they also preserved vegetables and pickled vegetables. And just like today, um, or a little bit more like today, you know, proximity to the countryside. So Austin's proximity to farmland allowed her to have fresher produce. She still probably didn't eat necessarily a fresh salad, um, but she would have had something fresher than what a person in the city might have purchased. So there's a lot of variation just like today, which I think is really exciting and allows us to really kind of, you know, communicate with that past. Hopefully we can get more to the more to these wonderful questions people have been raising yeah. after your video. But Casey, while you pull that up, uh, Anne, do you want to tell us about what these videos are? So Casey has very graciously reached into her recipe book and she has developed some historical recipes adapted for a modern audience of recipes that you might have found back in Jane Austen's time. And these are done in um, a style where we can kind of quickly see the process. If you guys are interested in these recipes, we'll be sending them around tomorrow and they're gonna be available on our blog tomorrow. So there's definitely a chance that something catches your eye for you to try it out yourself at home. And I, I will say that I, um, I also study a lot of um, digital media and how food is on digital. So I've been studying TikTok all summer. So these videos were very much inspired by very youthful vid cooking videos online. So just, I think Austin would have enjoyed them. So I'm not, I'm not too worried. <laughs> about the sugar there. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of sugar. <laughs> but you, you portion it out with seltzer water or what have you. <laughs> and that settles your stomach? 
evidently i i believe in vinegar settling your stomach it's another like old wives tale um i think that might have been more of the thing that settled people's stomach um stomachs the acidity of the vinegar balancing out ph rather than the sugar but who knows <laughs> Do we have time for one more video? Yeah, you mean to go to the next one? The next yeah, one's shorter, I think, too. Yeah, let's try one more. Was the volume, are y'all able to turn it down if it's too loud on y'all's end? I think I so. I think so, yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's the same song on this. <laughs> I didn't get too cute. reiterate that you're providing the recipes for these so those the recipes flip by very quickly so you have a, we'll have plenty of time to see those when we po post those tomorrow yes, and we'll be posting the recipe cards separate from the videos as well and the final recipe for those of you who are irked by egg separation and not using it the final recipe uses those three egg whites so. mm. Yes, there's going to be an extra video available online. So uh, watch your inboxes and our blog for, or our Facebook page. We'll be posting them on all of our social media. Okay, we have a few more, a few more minutes for questions. Um, on a more personal note, Susan Buonacore wants to know what lured you to the subject, the study of this subject. Of Jane Austen? Um, sorry, or maybe food. Um, food. I, um, I actually wanted to be a chef. I wanted to go to culinary school when I was in high school. Um, and my parents, uh, talked me out of it. They said, you like reading books too much. You like watching Jane Austen films too much. Um, you need to go and, and explore that, um, first. And so, um, I very thankfully listened to them and I ended up, um, going to university to study, um, you know, these things. But then also I was like, well, I'm still going to include food. So, I did that, and I'm very grateful to the to the people. Um, food studies was still a relatively kind of new thing at that point, and I'm very grateful to um, Dr. Barkus, who took on a crazy student who wanted to talk about food all the time. So you showed us some documents earlier about recipe. Lori wants to know what documents exist that outline what have, what would have been served at a more formal tea. Like, what do we know about tea rituals, and what still exists that's been written about that? 
So um, there's some really great books that go into that. Um, the, the, the issue I have with a lot of these books, um, we, we don't have too much written about the actual time of Jane Austen's time is the problem. We have, we know they drink tea, we know it was a ubiquitous drink, we know there was a lot of ritual and etiquette involved, but all of the etiquette that we really know and all of the high, the high tea concept, again, comes from the Victorian era. So a lot of the things that you see written about tea rituals and tea etiquette nowadays, stuff that's written like in contemporary times about the past, focuses on the Victorian era. And it even sometimes quotes Jane Austen erroneously. Um, there's a really good book that I have that I don't know if I included in the list because I do have problems with it um, that lumps, I know it's backwards, it lumps Jane Austen and Charles Dickens in the same group and they were not around really in the same time. Um, it's just, you know, it's a catchy thing to put Jane Austen with high tea. So, so whenever you do find these, um, these books, um, which I, I would refer again to the historical cookbooks, see what they say about tea, see what's listed in there. And oftentimes it's not, you know, it, there's not a lot there. There's, there's, this is how you make it. This is how you serve it. These are the different types. It's more educational rather than like aspirational about how you should become a tea ritual expert. Um, but whenever you do find one of these secondary books, like the one I just held up, pay attention to the dates. N look up when Jane Austen was around and when her books were very influential right after. Um, the reason why Dickens is mentioned at the same time is because Austen influenced Dickens. But that doesn't mean that the way they consumed tea was the same at all. So um, the dates matter. The difference in that time really matters. So when you look at those things, just kind of like hone in on those parts of it. A couple of people are drawing our attention back to the novels. Um, and uh, one person was hoping to hear you talk a little bit more about uh, food as gift, particularly the, the charitable giving of the Woodhouses and Emma. Um, uh, yeah, so um, we so we see that in Emma, and, and that's kind of like a, a tipping point in the book, but also in all the movies, we see all the grand gestures of Emma, like taking the pretty basket of food um, to Mrs. Beats. Sorry, the cat is coming to join. Um, I thought she was out of the room before I started this. I apologize. Um, and um, so, so it was a very normal thing to take food to each other's. It was considered very um, Christian, very much, um, you know, part of the expectation of the upper classes to give back to the lower classes, and specifically of women. Women were expected to do this kind of gift giving, um, which we still see happen today. It's always the women welcoming the new neighbors or the people with a new baby with with food. Um, so it's, you know, it's a tradition that lives on and has a bunch of gendered implications. Um, but we also see this in Austin's time. Um, remember, and um, her later in her life, she moved to Chotton and was effectively um, taken care of by her older brother who was inherited by wealthy people. So she was given this house to live in. She kind of survived off of her little bit of pen money um, and little odd kind of jobs and stuff like that. But she was given a lot of food. Um, and we see this in her letters. She was given a goose. She was given oranges to make mead. She was, you know, given all these different things. So gift giving in the food way um, was not only just part of the community process, it was just a normal thing you did um, because you also couldn't store all of it. You, you gave it because you needed to share, but it was also very, very normal in terms of um, the class dynamic. And um, for those who might want to maybe read into this a bit more, what would you say is the Jane Austen novel that has where food is most prominent? Would you say there's an equal amount of food and drink throughout Austen's works or are some of her books more food drink centric? Um, no, there's definitely clear ones that like Persuasion, her last book had pretty much no food in it, um, which is just really funny because um, it's actually my favorite book. Um, but it, it has very, I can't even, I can't even tell you if there's a food thing mentioned, um, tea obviously, and, and probably some alcohol. Um, Emma is actually a huge, it's a book about food. It is a food book. Um, Mr. Woodhouse is obsessed with his food intake. He's, he's got what we would call today orthorexia, where he constantly worries about his intake and his caloric intake and what he's eating and what others are eating. Um, you know, there's, every chapter has something about food and so many ceremonies and occasions revolve around food, much to Mr. Woodhouse's chagrin. Um, so that would be my go-to book for if you want food. Um, I think my favorite character within that, aside from Mr. Woodhouse, is Mr. Elton, who obsesses over food. Like he has a great chapter or part in a chapter where he talks about all these different cheeses. And you're just like, Elton, you're so weird. <laughs> so that would be my go-to. 
Um, speaking of that, you, you referred to colonization and the huge role of that in the foodways. Um, Julie is asking about what sorts of spices were the primary spices at the time. Yeah, so um, we need to remember that the spice route was already firmly entrenched in the in the foodways of the places that it went through. So medieval Europe was big on spices. Um, uh, Regency Georgian Europe or England, um, especially cut off from the continent where they were would have been importing a lot of the spices, um, just kind of wouldn't, they wouldn't have had a whole lot. They would have had salt and black pepper, um, and then they would have used a lot of different herbs and things that they had to spice things up. Um, tamarind would have been kind of, um, a, a, you know, it's not really a spice the way we qualify a spice, but that would have been part of it. Um, they would have used a lot of the like, um, the seasonal spices that we think of as seasonal, but would have been used more liberally um, during this time and before thinking of clove and things like that. And the one prop I forgot, nutmeg. Nutmeg wasn't everything. And so much so that some really wealthy, like people who loved nutmeg carried around their own nutmeg grinders. that had a little compartment where you could keep a little nutmeg nut and then you could like hold it over your food and grate your own nutmeg. And that was a sign of just, you made it. You were so wealthy. You had your own nutmeg grinder. <laughs> Who knew? Now we know what we needed. Yeah. <laughs> I have one. I'm so sorry I didn't bring it. I'm not wealthy, but I have a nutmeg grinder. <laughs> end off on this great question. Um, you as a food historian, as a food photographer, as somebody who loves to cook, what is the most difficult recipe you've had to recreate, either maybe from the Regency era or just in general historically? Um, I once was commissioned to do a bunch of test recipes for um, a gentleman from Iran. So it was with a bunch of different kinds of spices that I wasn't familiar with, and this was pretty early on in my time, um, but a lot of various kinds of preparations that I wasn't um, familiar with, um, uh, specifically with the meat. And so, um, and it had a lot of like slow roasting and braising and things like that, things that actually would have been pretty normal, and some spices that actually would have been normal in Austin's time. Um, so that I found particularly troubling, but this, um, I was really worried about this jello mold that I made, honestly. I was worried it was gonna be like way too difficult, um, and it might look difficult, but I promise it's not. It's really fun and really easy, and you'll feel very accomplished when you when you pop it out of the little mold or the bowl that you have. I was gonna say I was impressed alone just by how you're able to get that all out. <laughs> Follow the instructions, and you can def it'll work. <laughs> Well, we would like to extend our thanks again to you, Casey. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing your expertise. And for all of you still watching, if this talk whetted your appetite, like I said, uh, watch your inboxes tomorrow and our blog because we'll be sending around those recipe cards and links to those videos, as well as the list of resources that Casey has so kindly put together for us. Before we leave tonight, we would love to invite you to our next event, on July 9th at 5 p.m. Eastern, so the same exact time as this evening, we're gonna get all dolled up for Dressing with Jane Austen. Dress historian Hilary Davidson will be presenting on the social and political meanings of, Jane, of Dress and Jane Austen's novels and time. This program is once again free and will take place over Zoom, just like tonight. You can register for it through our website, janeaustinandco.org. And I'd just like to say, we recognize that there were some registration issues tonight, and we thank you all for your patience and working with us. We are currently in the process of transferring our registration system. So if you had an issue tonight, uh, hopefully soon we can get you re-registered for the next event so this does not happen again. But if at any point you are having difficulty registering, please feel free to reach out to us through Facebook or email info at janeaustinandco.org. And if you want to learn more about Jane Austen, her life, her afterlives and adaptations, come check out the blog for this Jane Austen summer program or follow us on social media. JASP is a four day summer symposium that on a normal year takes place in Chapel Hill, North Carolina in June. It features lectures, hands-on workshops, small discussion groups, a Regency ball, and other activities that blend scholarship with fandom. And you can learn more about that at our website at janeaustensummer.org. Um, and I believe uh, Inga has something that she would like to share with us as well. Oh, well, I was just gonna say that um, as a, um, this year's program was going to be 
on Jane Austen's world, focusing on the letters um, and a biography of, of Austen. Um, this program has been postponed till next year, and Casey will be not only talking, but cooking for us at that, at that event. So we're all looking forward to that. Um, and I also want to thank the 150 or so people who came to listen to her today. Thank you. Um, if you um, enjoyed tonight's programming, please also consider making a donation to the Jane Austen Summer Program. We'll send you um, a link about that as well when we give you a, the, the follow-up email. Um, and donations help us keep this kind of event free and open to the public and to bring great speakers like the um, authors we brought last year and, and Casey tonight. Um, and they also go to supporting our other outreach activities such as our student essay contest and our annual teacher scholarships. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all once again for attending. We hope that you guys remain healthy and safe. And we hope to see you all on July 9th with Hillary Davidson. And thank, thank you, you Casey. <laughs> thank, thank you again, you. Casey. <laughs> for letting me speak. I was so, it's so exciting. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.